the one of the beautiful things about essentialism, about pursuing those things that absolutely matter most, is that you then just live a life that matters most. Welcome to Noah Kagan Presents. What up, everyone? It's your boy, Sriracha, a.k.a. Rabbi Can't Lose, a.k.a. Noah Kagan. I'm going to give you a warning. This episode will likely change the way you think. It's really messed with my mind. We all know essentialism and prioritizing is important. We know that. We got it. But for some reason, we keep doing too many things, and most of those things don't matter. You know that person who's always busy but doesn't seem to get shit done? That's what I wanted to solve in today's episode. So in this conversation, I talk with Greg McCown, who is the author of one of my favorite books of all time, Essentialism. In this conversation, we talk about how to figure out what's essential, different strategies and tactics to stop doing other things that are not important, the difference between being a king and a king maker, and dealing with success when you finally get it. I can't wait for you to enjoy the episode. Have fun. And I just feel, I just can feel that like we're just on the edge of this, this big breakthrough. What do you mean? The temptation right now would be to write the next book. That's what ought to happen. That's the logic. You know, I, the first book is doing better now than it than it's ever done. It's it's moving in the right direction. You know, you should see it. A hundred to one author in this genre would, uh, you know, a year or two after the first book is out, would be either publishing or working on the next manuscript. Either the, the agent's ready for it. The, Publishers ready for it, and and really, there's a part of me that very much wants to do there. There's a there's a sort of um, muscle memory that says this is this would be the thing to do, but instead, I feel this complete uh, pull, this gravitational pull, um, in spiritual desire to go in a different direction, and it's been fascinating, and it feels right. How do you know to trust your instinct? So for me, the logical process, uh, the mental work uh, is serious and it includes a huge exploration of options, every, you know, every time for a big strategic choice like this. When you're really trying to say, what's the next level of contribution? That is something I take very seriously. And I don't know how many options, but I'm sure I consider hundreds and hundreds of options. I think about that sometimes where I, I do a blog post or a podcast or YouTube and I'm like, man, is this really like, is there a, a higher level of contribution I should be doing? Well, I mean, there's, there's, to, to me, it's always about, you know, type one versus type two contribution. A type one contribution would be within your existing sphere, within your existing platform. So if I'm writing blogs, there was a period when I was writing a lot of blogs and, and that's, that's an easier decision for me because it's just, Okay, what's the what's the best next blog? What feels like the, the the thing that would fit with the current audience, have a big impact, be really full of, of positivity and light? And so, but, but those are, those are easier because the fundamentals of the arrangement haven't changed. But in type two contribution, you're saying the whole point of type two conversation discussions is what's the next level? And by next level, it, I don't mean just ten percent more impact. It's like a full level up. It's 10x, it's 100x, it could be 1000x, but it's certainly something that breaks the bounds of, the, of, of type one. And so that's what makes it both worth pursuing. You know, it's, it's an intent that matters, that gets you up in the morning, quite literally up early in the morning to pursue something that matters. And also it inherently will for absolutely sure produce obstacles. Because, you know, obstacles really are our brain's best effort at explaining what work needs to be done to go from type one to type two. So obstacles, obstacles aren't something to be avoided. They're not something, they're not, oh, a necessary evil. Oh, I wish it wasn't different. It is, this is our brain's map to us. Of course, there are obstacles. If there's intent, there's obstacles. The one is, one is produced exactly when the other is produced. So with a, with a, with a higher level of contribution, it, it was suddenly a, a breakthrough of insight. Oh, this is the thing. This is, this is as far 
for me at least, it's like this. It's like as far as I can dream, like really, real dream. I don't mean, I don't mean just, I don't even mean crazy thoughts. I mean, what's the next big thing that I could feel, I could really just beyond probably my belief, I would say, uh, just, just out of reach. Uh, and I can point to a few specific examples in the past that are, are, are now clearly the game changers. The first one was quitting law school in England and, and pursuing teaching and writing. That was the first big shift. Uh, the second second big shift was was Stanford Business School. That was a goal for me. When that thought came to me, to my mind, it felt completely ricocheted. Like this matters, and uh, and it was so outside of my ability to do it. There's no false modesty in that. It was absolutely impossible to me that that could ever happen. And it was a three year journey, just constantly trying to work on all the obstacles that that were there. Plus, at least at least one miracle to make it all happen. And then, and then the third was, okay, New York Times bestselling author, did not, and not just for the sake of the title, but to have something that makes that sort of impact, to have something that can, can make a difference, to have a message that matters. And now we're on the next, the next wave. Uh, and, and so it can't, by definition, type two contribution can't be more of the same. It can't be something of the same level of impact repeated and and what's more it, it was very important to me the objective was always when it, with essentialism wasn't just to write a book that sort of hits a, the, the list you know times bestseller list and and then it's it's over the objective was to write a book that could exist you know was to write one book that lasts 10 years or or one book that lasts even a hundred years rather than a hundred books that each last one year so it means that you don't have to be in such an absurd hurry to write the next book, you know, because you say, well, that, that's, that, that's not, I might, I might even just confuse the reader to suddenly do another, to do another book and confuse the message to, to, to just jump onto some other subject completely. And I've seen that happen where there's sometimes write a second, third, fifth, tenth book. And, and over time, the, the message becomes far more cluttered. It's harder for people to know which part of, the real estate of their brain that author sits and so anyway these are all reasons for for shifting and instead to to work on a new platform so it's a, it's a platform change and that's that's I, I i can feel it's it's coming time what was the miracle that got you into the business school so i I'd, I'd applied both times only to stanford business school so uh, they have the lowest acceptance rate, at least they did at the time, of, of any business school in the world, right? So that is, that's, in a sense, really not a smart strategy to apply nowhere but there. But that is exactly what I felt I should do. I mean, this was prior to having written essentialism, of course, years and years before. But it was still quite an essentialist sensation that, that that's the thing. So don't apply to backup schools. And every time I'd apply to the other top 10 business schools in the world. As I started the process, I could feel the sense, no, you not don't do that. And that was that was definitely the intuition stepping in. That was um and so in the end I never applied it anywhere else. All of this led to this sort of crescendoed moment where we're presented into this moment of having done it the second time now, three years between the first and the, the, the second. And I just completely realized I'm I'm not I'm never getting in. Because this is the best I can do. The essays are the best. The GMAT's the best. This is who I am. But I could feel that it would not be enough. And it, there's just not the least bit false modesty in that. It's just as clear as could be, this is not going to be enough. And it's about three weeks before we find out you know, the results. And so I'm like pondering this. I'm meditating about this. I'm praying about this quite literally. And I just get this thought to reach out to a friend named Logan Woolley from uh, from early from years ago when I was on a mission in Toronto, and and I tried to reach out to him lots of times actually, but I've been misspelling his last name. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so I'd never in all these years, and and, and and he and I were good friends, and but we just, you know, it sounds so silly, but just and so all of a sudden I realized that, and and within like minutes I was talking to him, and. I mentioned in passing 
that I just applied to, to, to Stanford. He says, oh, I have somebody you should talk to, the smartest person I've ever met. He's a, 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 a PhD in this and Harvard Stanford. And so I talked to him on the phone and had a really nice conversation with him. And he said, oh, there's one person you should talk to. And, um, and that was uh, Joel Peterson, who was a faculty member at Stanford. I think he probably still is, uh, but he was then. And, and so I, I talked to him and, and he said, look, just come and, come and see me. And so what, what I knew that was, was an interview, a, 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 an unofficial interview. And my sense had always been that if I could be interviewed, I would do better than my essays because what I believed that GSB was Stanford was looking for was somebody who deeply, deeply wanted to make a difference in the world and cared about these things. And, and I thought that they would maybe be able to sense some of that and that might make up for some of the other areas that I lack. And so I, I met with him and... Uh, and, and his conclusion, in fact, was not very dissimilar to mine, um, but he, uh, in terms of not quite being qualified, but he just said, he said, no, you know, I think you're on the bubble. I think you're on the edge and I think they should interview you. And he emailed the department to, uh, to, to suggest that, that exactly that. And that's how I got the interview. And because of the interview, I got in. And, and I remember just the sensation that it was then, it was just felt right then. That, that maybe it would happen to me truly like I, I i'm sure to a lot of people and probably everybody listening this doesn't really sound so dramatic so to, to, to amazing but to me it was an unbelievable moment to get in it was it was the i knew there had been intervention on my behalf like i i and i i knew that, that i would never forget that because of how different it felt and how far from the goal uh I, I actually was. Not that I just felt I was, but I actually was. The two things I wondered were, when you finally got what you wanted, was it everything you thought it would be? And the precursor question, I just wanted to dive a little bit back into it, is just like, how did you figure out what you wanted? Let's start with the second, because it's the, the narrative order. The How did it get there is a state of constant brainstorm. I'm at, uh, I was at BYU at the time. I'm um, you know happily married and first daughter um, you know, on the way, but still constantly asking exactly the same question we've just been wrestling with, which is not, well, not what's the next thing, but what's the next level of contribution? What would be significantly beyond where you currently are? And uh, actually, uh, somebody came to church. I've never met the person, but they spoke. They just they had been asked spontaneously to speak for a few minutes, and they were at Stanford Law School. And that's it. I don't know who that person is. Someday maybe I'll you know, figure out who that is and thank them. But on the way home, talking to my wife, you know, this very common scenario. Hey, what about this? Should we do this? Should we do that? And I said, What if? What if we were supposed to go to Stanford Business School? And as soon as I said it, I could feel that complete confirmation. Just like, yes, that is interesting. I love and, that. And, and that. That was what was so different. There were many, many different brainstorms prior, but but no, you know, moment of comp of light. Ten out of ten. What you're recommending is that I should start going to church. Probably that. No, <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. No, but I think that's so. It's so amazing, Greg. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but you should. <laughs> you should. Yes, but you should. But not. But not. Not in the way that you're that you're implying. I'm suggesting. I. But 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 people do do need. I think. I mean. There was a, there was a whole article that was just uh, you know talking about you know the high design thinking and, and like they went through all of these I items. You need to go to a place free, uh, weekly of the, that inspires hope and faith. But people do me. I do. I won't talk about you. I'll talk about me. I don't know how to think through and live a life of highest contribution without. I I, I don't know how I would. I, how I could even just talk about the last 20 years without that. Uh, it, it has it has framed, and not just framed decisions, it has produced space to dream, to believe. I mean, a, a foundational idea, spiritually, my faith is that, that we are taught, is that, is that we literally are children of God, that we are that capable, that endowed with potential, enormous potential. And 
without that understanding that 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 life is a mission and that and that that I, I, I was built for purpose. The thing is, when we see people accomplish certain things, we don't realize all the thoughts that had to come into fruition. And it sounds like what some of your process is, is you spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I know in your book, you talk about that, which is think about it, think about it, process it. And I didn't realize it until you even get, kind of gave the story and then commit f- essentially to just the most important thing and go all in on that. This is the pattern. You're exploring broadly. For good or ill, I'm sure I spend 10 times what most people I talk to, 10 times the amount of time thinking about this question. What's your highest point of contribution? What's the next best thing? What's the thing that would be most impactful? What what really matters? What's the goal? What's the intent? What's the single thing that would be most breakthrough next? This is a constant, perhaps to a fault, uh, way of thinking for me. But out of it, if you keep the if you keep the criteria being basically, it's got to be a ten out of ten yes. It's got to be really clear. This is the thing. Something that then then you have what is necessary, which is to give something else up that you would also like to do. Um, it, with the Stanford example, it's well to give up applying to Harvard or to Columbia or. Or Oxford or Cambridge or, or the London Business School or Yale or like all of those are amazing schools and opportunities, right? But I felt that I was supposed to trade that off. Don't even apply. You've got to trust completely in this answer. You've got to go all in. And I remember calling it Stanford or bust. And I felt that with with essentialism in writing it, it was essentialism or bust. You know, so this is a very repeated pattern for me. And I, that what I see, I definitely see like a funnel experience where you're first exploring very broadly, many, many options. And then that tilts to, uh, you know, eventually there, there, there seems almost every time to get to a point where it's, there's two remaining options. There's a couple of things in, in front of you and they both, you want both of them. I want both of them. And realizing each time, no, you, but you must still make a trade off. If you want, the very best, highest option, you're going to have to kill the other. There might be some people out there that are so gifted and capable or, or simply more capable than me, which isn't so hard, that that they could do both. But it's just not been that way for me. I, I am confident I would not have got into any of the top five business schools if I tried to apply to all five. I, I just am confident of that. And the same with the, the book. There came a point with the book where – where when I was trying to decide which book to write, there were multiple options. At first, there was a bazillion ideas, and eventually it got down to two. And one of those ideas was more developed than the other, and I was logically, that was the one to do. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night one time and just not being able to get back to sleep and spending a couple of hours kind of wrestling with this logically, spiritually, prayer back and forth, and I just kept on getting this sense You've got to write it. It wasn't called essentialism, then it was clarity. Just it was this as, as unnamed as the clarity book. And I just kept on. And the other one was about like design for leadership and and uh, it was was far more developed. Uh, I mean, chapter titles and that kind of thing. And I just kept on feeling this pull to clarity. And so by the end of that evening, I had committed by which means I had made the trade off. You haven't committed until a trade off is made. And essentialism grew out of that. It is so clear in hindsight that this was the, the more interesting book. It was the more resonant book. It was the more universally applicable book. It's in the zeitgeist. All of those things that I didn't understand at that time. How do you deal with the doubt? So I, I've had this problem where I'll commit to something and say, oh, this is definitely it. And I'm going to do this. And then a little bit going into it, I start, you know, maybe the the wall of fear or the wall of failure or the wall of self-doubt. And how have you, how, how'd you deal with that with the book? I struggle uh, with second guessing and rethinking uh, a lot. Uh, part of the part of the the benefit of brainstorming, right? Part of the sort of almost being a professional brainstorming, thinking, oh, could, could be this, could be that, could be the other, it means you you have that muscle memory after you've made a decision too. So you can, can that continues to sort of be a slight plague on the process. But what I have found is that, that I mean, that's one of the reasons I need the internal discipline that grows out of the highest level of clarity. Like the clarity, the 10 out of 10 
means that I can it can keep coming back to that like a touchstone. Yes, you knew. Remember that evening you felt such clarity, such peace. That's the book you're supposed to write. You remember that sensation. And so I keep coming back to that. That's the only way I know of how to keep to stay the course. So one, one more time, like there's some people who I see that seem to have the ability, um, actually my best friend growing up seemed to have the ability that he, he could just keep going on a task, even if it wasn't very pleasant for him, just day in, day out, consistency, born out of a sort of it just, just solid work ethic uh, and down to earth uh, discipline and, and solidness. I just didn't recognize that in me. I don't, that, that's not how it, how it is for me. For me, to, I must get that kind of level of clarity. That's what, that's what gets me to do the day in, day out work of something and, and gets me to be able to keep believing uh, when it's, uh, it, it literally feels uh, on the other edge of impossible. Ooh, that's a great line. The other edge of impossible. You know, I was wondering, uh, we, we just to finish the, the thought with what we, we open with, sometimes when I've gotten the things I wanted, they weren't as great as what I was hoping they would be. And, and I think about with people with money, a lot of people think I have, I have, I have a lot of clarity <laughs> that I want to make a million dollars or a hundred thousand or 10,000 and they get it and they realize it doesn't do the things that they were hoping for. So I was curious with, you know, with your things as you've gotten them that because you wanted them so badly and you were so clear on that. Uh, how was it when you finally got it? I've experienced what you're describing, and, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But let's get back to this camper for a moment. That that wasn't one of those times. I wasn't there primarily for the the Stanford Badge of Honor or for a great job or for like it was such mission driven thing that when I was was there, I could still feel the sense of mission about it. And that this was built for purpose. So I didn't feel the uh, that sense of, of hollowness and shallowness that I think can come with achieving, well, basically, w- that can come with achieving the wrong goal. Um, I mean, or, or at least, uh, you know, a goal that people thought was going to be more meaningful than it really was. So, so I do think that there are a whole set of successes in life that people pursue and hold up and celebrate that uh, that are empty, so relatively empty that it's uh, that it's strange. Okay, so when I think about the difference between the before essentially and afterwards, the opportunities and options accelerated so fast that I I was struck definitely with the sense of well. Well, what's this all about then now? What's what's it about? If if you can if you hit a certain point, you know, even, even financially for a start, well, what's it about? What's left? Like if you if you spend if if so much of life is about for, for so many people is about you know making ends meet and and that's very worthy you know effort and work. There's a certain point where you, this is no longer producing that meaning because in a sense money is now a non a non-issue and i suddenly did find myself going okay there's a lot of shallowness in this type of success uh you know this does not feel like this will that that pursuing more money or pursuing you know, more things or pursuing nicer clothes or you know or, or, or traveling more, like the idea, for example, of saying, well, now we could travel four or five times a year. Like what? What does it mean? What does traveling that many times mean that once or twice doesn't mean? You know, there's a definitely diminishing returns. And so I think that in this case, one must go back to the original questions, right? One must, must go back to, okay, what is the right thing? What what is the work to be done? What's the contribution that needs to be made? It's back to essentials. Otherwise, success will pull us massively off track and and not give us anything back for it. Uh, success I have definitely found to be a poor master. And there's a a superb treatise um, 
on the same subject uh, written better than anything I can write um, is by Tennessee Williams in an article he published in the New York Times after the Glass Menagerie came out and was uh, was this you know this this play that was breakthrough success. The, the essay is called The Catastrophe of Success. I mean, if you had to come up with a, a title to a piece about success, I just don't think most people would use that word, you know, the blank of success. I think people will be saying the awesomeness of success, the, you know, the benefits of success, it's the, the way to success. But this is the catastrophe of success. He talks about how it almost derailed him. People would come up to him and say, oh, gosh, man, it's just changed my life. It's really fantastic. And he just couldn't absorb any of it. He just couldn't feel any, anything. He was sort of almost past feeling with this. And, and the only thing he could do, what he found would save him, what saved him, was to go back and write. <laughs> just do the work itself. He said, I, I stopped you know, staying, staying at hotels. I would not, I, w- I refused to have anybody clean up for me. I can relate to this. Sometimes people read essentialism. They'll say to me, yes, I have applied essentialism. And they will tell me how they have applied essentialism. They will say, uh, you know, I, the first thing I've done is I've hired somebody that cooks all the meals for my family now, hired somebody to you know, transport my children to school. And they, they, what they're describing is an outsourced strategy. Maybe they're right. I, I'm not trying to be judgmental about their choices. But when I hear it, something doesn't feel quite right about that to me, because it's saying that that work doesn't need to be done. That work's not important. And and what I've learned is that that work is the work itself, that um, that making food together with my family and then eating it together and then clearing it away together is the work. That's the that's the work. That's the stuff that keeps you grounded. That's the stuff that helps you bond as a family. That's the stuff that that is where the next set of dreams are born and you know and nurtured. That's where the memories are made. So these people are obviously in financially successful position enough that they can outsource those things. It's to be careful to not outsource the actual essential work. It might be the more boring work or it might be the hardest of the work, but to be careful not to, you know, that that's really what Tennessee Williams had started to do. He's staying in hotels all the time. Someone else is making his food, cleaning everything up, making his bed, doing all of this. And he just said, you know, there's something suddenly seemed so vacuous about this. It's interesting because in my personal time, I've been spending my time doing podcasts, blogging, YouTube, and then two side software projects. And I don't think it's generally healthy personally to be, well, I, I want to live my life thinking, well, what would Greg do? And then I go and do that. And then I go and say, what would Greg have for breakfast? And then I go and make only that essential item. And it really got me reflecting as, as you were sharing these stories. And I love the message of hard work. I, I, I believe truly that we're all looking for shortcuts. And the shortcut is hard work. That's the shortcut. Go do hard work. Yeah. And I have to and I have to remind myself. And in addition, I was thinking about a laser or I think in your book, you, you know, you use a lot of scribbles, which is. I'm doing, you know, five separate things and I, and I started th- and I have people helping me with it. And you could argue on one hand, well, they're, they're each working on what's essential to them. And I, it just got me reflecting on, well, what if all five of us, like the, uh, you know, instead of five projects, I focused on one and I have five people helping me. And, and when, instead of all five people doing five kind of separate things like the blog and the podcast and this and that, what if everyone was just doing YouTube and how much if that I believed was my highest contribution and the biggest thing I could be doing and everyone was aligned around that. And so this, you know, would be more of a video with that we could turn this into and so forth. And it just got me really thinking about that. It's like, wow, yeah, that could be so much bigger and so much more impactful and powerful than kind of, you know, spreading the water so thin. Uh, I, I mean, I certainly, Oh, you would not be surprised that I certainly subscribe to this and it's, it's legion that I have conversations I've had with people you know, yes, they got they got the book, and they, they, you know they got their blogs, and they got their their, their their podcast, and they've got their YouTube, and they've got and they're working on these ten different different platforms. And I just think one always has to be careful. Sometimes those are complementary. Sometimes that works together in, a, in an overall strategy that is better. You know that there is this inherent synergy that that makes the the, the whole greater. 
than the sum of its parts. And sometimes it's just 10 different products. In effect, like the, 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 the end listener user doesn't know that, doesn't think like that. But in fact, you have to have a completely different strategy on, on video for YouTube than you do on your podcast, than you do on the blog. And, and actually, it's enormous effort to maintain each of those different products. I mean, that is one of the lessons I've, I've found and one of the reasons I like to try and be really careful about what, what projects to take on, what directions to go on in my life is that, is that I think things that appear to be very similar are often not very similar. So for example, writing a book and, and having a successful book and then having a successful speaking business is not at all the same thing. It's even though you are speaking about the book. And and so people are thinking the user's mind, well, you know, yeah, I heard him speak and I read the book. It's the same thing. That's what it ought to feel like from the user's point of view. In the same way as if you go to Disneyland, you know, and you go on the on the car's ride, it ought to feel like you're inside the movie. That's what they're going for. If from a user's point of view, it should feel like the same thing. But think of what a different business that is. The, the, the movie is such a different business model than the section of the park at Disneyland. I think that's true. And in information-based business, knowledge-based business, learning-based business, it's like, like what you're doing, like what I'm doing. It's tempting to minimize the differences. I definitely, I mean, I just had a call from a New York Times bestselling author who called me up specifically to have a conversation about this because here he is with a really successful book and the speaking business is, is doing nothing. And so we were just talking about why that might be. It reinforced for me that this insight that I've had is, is right. They're different businesses. And so by parallel metaphor, I think a lot of people listening today, there are all sorts of options that overlapping with other work that they do and so that they can make the connection in their heads as to why they would do project B, C, and D because they're doing project A. But in fact, they're completely different initiatives. They're massively different. And so they ought to be treated differently. They ought to be, the cost of them is far higher than is originally obvious. And so for me, among other things, I, you know, I don't do any coaching. I don't do any consulting. Those are two obvious businesses one should do. I've been the, the most against doing workshops, essentially workshops for ages. It's not the keynote. It's a completely different business. All right, I've got five things. Uh, we'll just do the, the rule of five. And, and you know what was funny, man? I, I will tell you, I struggled when I was... We've, we've talked a bunch of times and I was like, oh, I should just come with one essential question. <laughs> I was like, oh, I should just ask only one question and then that will be the only one that matters. And I actually struggled because there were certain things I just really wanted your take on and I wanted to share some of your messages that I thought are so powerful. Okay, but if you, if you did have one question, what would the one question have uh, been? Uh, I should have pu- I should pushed, I should push you. Good, on, good, good for pushing me. I should have said right from the beginning, I should have said, What's, you get one question, make it count. The one thing we talked about last time that I've been thinking about a lot, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the king versus the king maker. I thought that was such a unique opinion about some people want to be creating the product and some people want to be promoting the product. And I thought that was a unique thing that, you know, you were talking about Oprah and major versus minor. Can, can you, you know, refresh me and then uh, everyone else about that and, and what, what your thoughts about being a king versus king maker or queen versus queen maker? <laughs> well... I mean, first of all, it's just a helpful way of thinking. I, is is somebody a king or a kingmaker? There's there's so many amazing professionals I've met who are who are kingmakers, right? They're the reason that the the outward facing person can do what they do. I and mean, that's true in every field of endeavor, right? It's true, it's true for political leaders, prime ministers, and presidents, and, and literal kings, right? They can't do what they do without these other people, and there are these other people who's own mission is and they feel their mission is not to be the face of the operation that that is not where they feel centered at home and making their highest contribution so so i think that is a distinction to figure out do i want to be the i'm supposed to be the king of something or the the king maker of something and as i was grappling with that years ago i suddenly realized well there is another alternative which is to be the king of the king makers there are roles for people like this. I mean, I think if we, if I remember the conversation about Oprah, right, it's is that is that she's gone through a sort of transition this way, 
uh, where you know she's she's the, the king, the queen of her own show, 25 years, making this you know tremendous impact around the world, uh, and then all of a sudden reaches a point where the next level of contribution for her is to is to create a platform for other people to create their shows and to be the to, to be the face of those shows, and and it's a long, tough journey to build that new platform, as we can observe and as she's, she's observed. But that's that's sort of a next level of contribution still. And I still love that. I still think it's a helpful way of, of thinking. For me, it was like, do I go work on do I go work on software products or do I go work on content and promoting people's products and promoting people like yourself? And you actually commented, which I thought was interesting with Oprah, where, you know, she's done these shows and she recommends books, but she's actually never really sold a, a best selling book herself. She hasn't written these books. Yeah. I mean, you know, she has published books and are not. I, I, I don't know the numbers involved, but but clearly there have been books that she has recommended that have been more successful than any book that she's written. So so her sense of what I'm supposed to do isn't I got to go write that best selling book. Uh, it's I want to use the platform of television to to launch all these other ideas, and that's liberating. So where did you come down on this? What are your thoughts? I've been thinking about where. Do I want to be making products or do I want to be promoting? And and I like promoting. That's where I am right now. It feels right. And it feels like there's other people within the organization and in my life that are making the products and that's essential to them. And now even within that level, it's like, well, I do believe YouTube to me is really the calling of sharing messages of myself that I'm interested in or other people's messages. And and I just like that I had time to reflect on that and how you fr- help frame it for me. For a lot of people listening, Greg, and I'm everyone knows essential is important. It's, it, there are certain things that we all know, right? And like, if you tell someone like, hey, just focus on what's important, they're like, yeah, of course, I only do the most important. Or people are like, I'm really busy. I only get, you know, I, I get a lot of things done. I'm like, how come I don't really seem, and nothing seems impressive? And so everyone, I think, gets it. But what is, what I always like to encourage for the audience is, you know, what is something that they could do today to learn how, how powerful essentialism can be? I think that... I think that what people should do is go the opposite way. I think they should go through a thought experiment to push non-essentialism to its absurd conclusions. So, so it's not a doing thing. I'm not, I'm not asking them to suddenly go and do one thing to discover essentialism. It's, it's a sort of do, right? It's a mental do. Just embrace non-essentialism with a vengeance. This is funny. I was at LinkedIn teaching. This was early on after the book came out. And we had a lunch right before. There's something that's still a woman. She said, no joke. My New Year's resolution this year, so this was about four months before I was there, my New Year's resolution was to say yes to everything. No joke. And and I just thought this was like delightful, right? Like delightfully ironic moment as she's in this essentialism luncheon. And she just, and I said, well, how, what happened? You know? <laughs> and uh, and she's like, well, you know, <laughs> it's like almost a breakdown. Uh, you know, just a course, massively overstressed. I mean, just to hear a description of what a say yes to everything life looks like helps us to see the madness of it all. Just try and do everything. I was at, uh, as it, uh, you know, just this last week where I was with a room of very brilliant people and they were sort of in, in, in between. Uh, and some of them definitely weren't buying into essentialism, you know, like, they had achieved so much in their lives from really sacrificing a lot that they didn't recognize. First of all, they didn't recognize they'd been essentialists in lots of ways. Uh, but they also just thought, well, no, you know, the answer is that we just need to do more. And so instead of trying to argue for essentialism, I just went there with them and I said, OK, well, let's just let's just assume that non-essentialism works and it's perfect. You know, you have no trade offs. You have no nothing. Just don't. Let's just take it all the way. Never sleep. Never stop. Never say no. Do it all. Push the limits. See how much you can do. You're bound to break through to the next level of success. And the more we went into that and the longer I persisted in my side, almost an irritating point perhaps of whatever, they, however they defend them against non-essential, I, I try to argue that it was still the way. You, eventually, you just there's no argument there. You recognize that life is inherently trade-off experience. And from that point, we were able to build a little step further, a little bit more of the bridge. Well, if you do face some trade-offs, if there are some limits, how do you handle those inherent 
trade-offs and limits. What do you do? And one of the people was honest and saying, well, you know, I think I just sort of react all day long. I just get up and, you know, I'm just reacting and responding to whatever the people want or need. And that's, that's what I do. That's my, that's my strategy. Reaction is my strategy. And so then we were able to take that inch more after that and to say, well, well, is that the most wise and humane and kind way of handling those trade-offs? Is it possible that a more deliberate strategic approach would produce better contribution for you and for all the people around you? And it became obvious, you see, obvious by this point. Yeah, well, of course. Of course, there's a more deliberate thing. And, and let me just complete the thought experiment here by saying, because one of the people in the room did say, he said, we say, OK, so I buy this. I buy that. I buy that non-essentialism isn't the answer. But but wouldn't essentialism become absurd if you went too far with it? He said, he said, for example, I mean, wouldn't wouldn't essentialism mean that you just had a, a one legged stool, you know, because it's, it's one is better than three. And I said, well, well, only if I'd written a book called Oneism, you know, <laughs> only if. The point is one, which, of course, is is absurd, would be absurd. But I didn't. I wrote a book called Essentialism. And so the question is, is can you live a life that's too focused on what's most important? No, I don't think so. I think even if you take it to the absurdist level, one of the beautiful things about essentialism, about pursuing those things that absolutely matter most, is that you then just live a life that matters most. (laughs) There isn't. Most of the ideas I've ever worked with or, or, or come to care about or love or believe have a point at which you go, okay, that's now too much. You know, don't go too far with it. Essentialism isn't one of those. Uh, counterfeit forms of essentialism will quickly become absurd, but not essentialism itself. Uh, and so that's the thought experiment I think people can go on. Imagine the opposite, and then t- take take it to the extreme. See see which see which way really makes sense. I really don't understand how every time I talk to you, there's always new things, and I'm always giving a, a amazing stuff to go reflect on and and implement. It's you, Noah. It's you. You 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 create the space. Yeah. And the the openness and the conversation to explore things together. Well, it's us. It's definitely us. Yeah. And one of the things you talk about in your book is saying no to people. And, and I've, I've even joked that my parents name me Noah because I have to say no to people all the time. Huh. And one thing I've been wondering is a lot of us have people we don't like in our lives or friends that we don't find essential or that we don't add to our lives. How do you deal with them? There's that, that guy or girl you don't like and they text you, hey, what's up, Greg? You want to go play squash? Uh, <laughs> you know, what do you, what do you do? There are circumstances in which the wisest part is to invest a little. Yeah, that the that that a little bit can be a lot cheaper than nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, for example, if there's somebody you just think, oh, this person, you know, they're always emailing me, they just tell me a bit that. Yeah, you can ignore them completely, but actually, that takes quite a lot of attention. You have to like, okay, I'm not going to respond. I'm just going to deal with that awkwardness. I'm just going to, you know, there's there's a cost to nothing, to doing nothing. So. I found that a little bit, right? You know, to, to simply to say, okay, there's this person to respond with a quick email, a tiny email. Within, I mean, there's a, a great little idea in, in Adam Grant's book, Give and Take. I think the most practical single idea, in fact, I would say in that book is the, is the five minute favor. And and you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to allot a certain amount of time to certain activities, um, and and I'm going to I'm going to block it so that once I've got to that amount, there's no more. I'm not giving any more. I mean, and, and in fact, podcasts and interviews, it's, it's, it's just this way to me. They're not the five minute favorites, but they, they, there's a certain amount of time. I do a media morning once a month. That's, that's what I do. Once it's filled, you move to the next, the next month. So there's always just enough of it, but never too much of it. And I think this is, this is a sort of subtle approach to, to applying essentialism, that, that instead of just cutting something off, and I mean, I've learned it this way too. And I've learned you, you just burn bridges with people. You, the cost is high, and that cost can keep on going. Whereas, in to to just keep something in a sort of reasonable, disciplined, s- small element of maintenance can be far 
are less expensive. So that's something I've learned. You're doing the, the TV stuff now, right? Yeah, that's the thing. And it's been, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was last summer that I decided not to do the book. At the time, I was still trying to straddle it, ironically. Do the next book, do the TV show. And as a result, I was feeling very awkward about the book because I really wanted to do it but could feel it wasn't the right thing. So that was like kicking against, you know, something I sort of knew and, and trying to force it. And then on the TV front, it meant that I was making just very little progress because just the maintenance of life, right? The the, the speaking, the, the the media call like this, the just the just the ongoing work of life consumed an enormous amount of space. So let's say there's twenty percent remaining for new for, for the next thing where you're investing in the next breakthrough. Well, that was being split between these two things. It meant that there's hardly anything left for an area. TV show that I know nothing about. So you're trying to get up to speed and move forward on something that you don't really have time to do. And, you, and it's pretty uncomfortable because you don't know how to do it. And the chance of failure is so high. And that was where I was last summer. And it just felt very clear, very similar to these other com- parts of this conversation today. You've got to, you've got to trade off. You can't do both. And you've got to make your choice. And the right choice is to do a television show. And so I quit. And it was right after that that literally within days, if I recall it right, that Steve Harvey read Essentialism and blogged about it and said, this book has changed my life. And what's imp- most important about that is that is that if I had not made the strategic trade-off days before, I would hardly have noticed it. You know, I'd have gone, oh, that's an interesting moment. That's a sort of just cultural, cool thing and move forward. But because of the decision, I could now see that that was more than just a blog. Hey, let's just explore if there's a, if there's more that could be done here. I just finished uh, the fourth episode with him, the fourth appearance with him, where we're doing now essentialism life makeovers for people in his audience, and it would is it, this is like materially completely different wow. than, than six nine months ago. And then it, simultaneous to this, um, uh, WME, which is one of the two largest talent agencies in, in, in movies and TV, an agent there reached out to me. Hey, will you come and speak on essentialism at our annual retreat? And so I did that. And so suddenly there's agents, there's you know a relationship, an ongoing relationship with Steve Harvey and his show, and there's a producer now that uh, that, that wants to 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 do a show. And you know I don't know if any of this will amount to, to any more. Um, I'm i this is a real life present exploration and and, and mission and endeavor. But I, I can, I am witness to, I think, a miracle, right? To me, it's an unbelievable power to see the difference between following that guidance, that prompting, or not following it. And if I had tried to carry on doing both, I am confident that none of this would have happened in television. And when I think that that's sort of six to nine months in this 20% space, that's the path, and we're, we're, we're hopefully on to... We, I can sense that it's some things will come together. So I'm sure it will take a long time and lots of failure along the way, but it still feels like the right journey. So that gives you a fire for the deed. I hope you get everything you want along the way as well. A, a pleasure as always. Same here, Greg. Well, that's a wrap. I hope you loved this episode as much as I did. Number one, if you love this episode, go give Greg McCown some love on Twitter or go buy his book, Essentialism. Number two, Text a friend you love him. Just say, hey, yo, bro, or hey, friend, or amiga. I hope you're doing well. Number three, give me feedback on Twitter, at Noah Kagan, N-O-A-H-K-A-G-A-N. I love hearing from you. I even love when you say hi at a pizza place, wherever it is. Number four, have a spectacular day. What's your favorite vegetable? 